4 is where we will spend almost all of our time tonight. We've been in a series looking through Joshua on Sunday evenings, um, and we'll continue that tonight. So just to remind you kind of where we're at, again, we've uh, Joshua is the right-hand man to Moses. Moses has passed the torch, so to speak, onto Joshua. And the nation of Israel has been wandering, and now they're literally on the banks of the Jordan about to cross over into the Promised Land. And we looked last, or two weeks ago, rather, in chapter 3. Uh, chapter 2 is Rahab and the spies. You're probably familiar with that. Chapter 3 is just this... Joshua really could be made into an incredible movie, really. Uh, it's this amazing account. And sometimes I think we are tempted to gloss over Joshua because it's almost so fantastic that we forget that this is not fable, this is not science fiction, this is real history that happened for the nation of Israel. God delivered in such a big way. So he got, in, in chapter 3, we see the nation of Israel um, getting to the edge of the water. Remember, it would have been in springtime, in, in high tide, that river would have been moving. And, and Joshua's trying to get the nation across, and, and he, they had to wait for days watching this incredible river, and then ultimately head into Jordan. In chapter 4, is one of my favorite chapters to visualize the faithfulness of God. Chapter 4, if you've been reading ahead, you know where we are. This is God instructing the nation of Israel to put out these, what are called in Scripture, memorial stones. These giant stones that are supposed to go before the nation of Israel to memorialize what God has done. And so really, I'd like to read this tonight, but, but the lesson that I, I hope will challenge us this evening is remembering God's faithfulness in our lives. You know, again, Joshua has the unique privilege of being in the midst of some incredible miracles, right, that are happening. Uh, just as an aside, it, it's almost really not even miracles because, again, a miracle by its definition is something above and beyond the laws of nature, right? So had Joshua been the ones to provide all of this, certainly. But God doing this is doing very much what's within the nature of God to do, right? But God is providing for them in an incredible way, an incredible providential way. And I'd like to read this chapter 4 and give us a few thoughts as we kind of look down through this, and we'll read this together. And again, I want you to, to put yourself in the shoes of an Israelite at that time. You've been wandering all this time, and now you're able to, to cross over into the land that has been promised to you. But remember, it's still not without challenge, because now they're going to get over there, and they're going to find, they know already, that there are tribes there that aren't just going to hand this land over. So Joshua really is a book that is just faithfulness after faithfulness after faithfulness, a challenge of their faith over and over and over again. Um, that's not dissimilar from the life that we live. So let's read this together, Joshua 4, starting in verse 1, and we'll stop along the way for commentary. All, when all the nation had finished passing over the Jordan, the Lord said to Joshua, take 12 men from the people, from each tribe a man, and command them, saying, <coughs> excuse me, take 12 stones from here out in the midst of the Jordan, from the very place where the priest's feet stood firmly, and bring them over with you and lay them down in the place where you lodge tonight. Then Joshua called the twelve men from the people of Israel whom he had appointed, a man from each tribe, and Joshua said to them, Pass on before the ark of the Lord your God into the midst of the Jordan, and take up each one of you a stone upon your shoulders, according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, that this may be a sign among you. When your children ask in a time to come. Now, remember this. Part of this memorial is not just for the people to remember in the moment what God had done. Because remember, God so often is more concerned, not more, is equally concerned about what's going to happen with the next generation and the next and the next. Part of why the church was established the way that it is to continue on this legacy of faith that began in the first century and we still inherit now. And so God is telling them, listen, this is not just for you, but there's going to come a time where your children are going to come ask, how did we get here? How, tell me the story, right? We did a whole theme at PBC a few years ago centered around that very idea, storytelling in the Bible. 
And this is one of those great opportunities. Tell me the story and God's providing for them away. When your children ask in a time to come, what do these stones mean? And I love this, even in the Old Testament. What does this stone mean to you? Not what does this stone mean to my neighbor? What does this stone mean to this group? What does that stone mean to you? Then you shall tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord when it passed over the Jordan, and the waters of the Jordan were cut off. So these stones shall be to the people of Israel a memorial forever. And the people of Israel did just as Joshua commanded and took up 12 stones out of the midst of the Jordan according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, just as the Lord told Joshua. And they carried them over with them to the place where they lodged and they laid them down. Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan in the place where the feet of the priest stood, uh, bearing the Ark of the Covenant has stood and that there was to this day. For the priest bearing the Ark stood in the midst until everyone had finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to tell the people according to all that Moses had commanded to Joshua. The, peace, the people passed over in haste, and when all the people had passed over, the Ark of the Lord and the priest passed before them. Now I want to take a pause here. Because again, this is going to go through all the people that are going to pass over and, and everything, but I want to give you a couple thoughts that come from this as we think about the faithfulness of God. What, what, what does being faithful mean? What, what does faithfulness mean for you and me? And, and particularly with regards to memorializing the faithfulness of God. I want, I want, maybe a better way to put this is I want to offer you a couple places in your lives where I hope that you will remind yourself of the faithfulness of God. We look in Joshua chapter 4 starting in verse 1 and I want to encourage you to remember God's providence in your life. Now, God's providence is, is something that we don't know a lot of specifics about, but God's providence is simply talking about the way God cares for us, right? All the ways that God provides, and there's a variety of even thoughts and theories as to how far that providence extends. Um, you know, could that be, uh, some people suggest it's very direct. Some say it's much more hands-off. But either way, God is very much a part of our everyday lives. And the stones were meant to remind the children of Israel of the ways God had provided for them when it seemed impossible. Now, again, this was a very direct way that this was supposed to happen. But God still provides for you and me. And I want to challenge us because we see this in other places in Scripture. If you look in Genesis chapter 28, and we don't, we don't have to go there for the sake of time, but Genesis 28, starting in verse 18, Jacob was instructed to set up a stone pillar that very much served the same purpose, to remind him of God's faithfulness in their life. If you look in Exodus chapter 20, God told Moses to build a stone altar to remember his covenant on Mount Horeb. And we look at this all throughout Deuteronomy 27 points to this. Joshua talks about this again. We'll look at this again in Joshua chapter 8. But I want to encourage you, if you'll allow me to think about the, the metaphor here, what stones do we have in our lives to remind us of the faithfulness of God? I, they're going to look different for each of us. But I want to encourage you as a family, as an individual, to find these things and set them before your family. To remind you day in and day out, because here's the truth, and you know this, the challenge for us in our lives is, is not to cultivate a love for God, it's not to cultivate a desire to serve him, but, but many times other things come into our life that just take over, right? Work begins to get busy, uh, things get a little more hectic, and God begins to slide further down our priority list. If you remember, at the beginning of last year, I gave you a magnet with our firm foundation theme on it to put on your refrigerator. In essence, that was meant to do something, a very small, similar thing to, to Joshua's stones, to remind you to be a visual example of God's plan and God's firm foundation. And I hope that that's been a help to you this year. But my challenge for you is, again, before they entered the promised land, God had already warned the Jews about the dangers that come when they enter in. He told them, listen, there's going to be tribes there that don't believe what you believe. He says, Deuteronomy chapter 6, watch yourself that you don't forget the Lord who brought you from the land of Egypt out of the house of slavery. He told them directly, don't forget the God that got you to this point. 
you know, a lot of times we think about, and, and for many of you, you've been a Christian for a long time, and there's a lot of benefits and experience that comes with being a Christian for 20, 30, 40, 50 years. But some of the challenge, and you and I have talked about this a lot, is when you become that experienced, sometimes we forget what it's like back in the very beginning. We have to think back to what was it like before I became a Christian, right? What was it like before I went into the waters of baptism? What is it like to not be a part of the church? God encourages the, the children of Israel to have that remembrance, because we look throughout scripture and we see example after example of, again, followers of God that have fallen away simply because they didn't set that reminder before them. And that was God's encouragement to them through verses one through five. Joshua called on these 12 men to lay down these stones ahead of them. Number two, God encouraged them to remind their children of God's faithfulness. Let's reread verses six and seven that this may be a sign among you when your children ask in a time to come, what do these stones mean to you? Friends, there may be no greater question that you get asked by the next generation than why do you believe what you believe? Right, and, and maybe you have this remembrance, maybe you remember asking mom and dad this, mom and dad, why is church a priority to us? You know, I remember vividly, I don't remember how old exactly I was, but I remember the response my parents gave of, you know, every kid has the question at some point, mom and dad, why do our family do this, but all my other friends' families, they don't go to church on Sunday, they don't do this and that. Why, why is our family different? My guess is that every one of you have had that conversation to some degree. That's what God was telling them. Listen, your children are gonna ask why those stones are there. Mom and dad, why are, that, why are those stones there? Why do we do A, B, C, and D? And he tells them, he, he, he tells them ahead of time, tell them that the waters of the Jordan were cut off before the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord when it passed over the Jordan and the waters were cut off so that these stones shall be a memorial forever. Joshua advised that the stones would not just be for this current generation, you know, you've probably seen those statistics that the church, if the church just stopped everything, it would cease to exist in between three to four generations. If it stopped teaching, if we stopped evangelizing, if we quit coming, and again, that's a far extreme that won't happen, but if it just completely quit, and that's not just unique to church, you talk about any organization. Anthropologists have done study after study and found that within three to four generations, whole civilizations have basically been wiped from everyone's memory but in written history. It does not take thousands of years for things to quit being relevant. And Joshua encouraged them for this. He knows that our memories are short. He wants to challenge the parents, the grandparents, because again, the danger is we look at church, let's make it relevant for us, not, not just for them. We look at us and we recognize that, you know, maybe generation one, so mom and dad are a little bit less prioritized about church than grandparents were. And children were a little bit less than mom and dad were. And grandchildren are a little bit less still. And again, in just our lifetimes, we can go from a family that is incredibly faithful and on a path to heaven to a family that has no connection to the church anymore, has no connection to God, has no connection to heaven. Joshua taught them to remind themselves of their faithfulness. We look in Exodus chapter 13. We look in Deuteronomy chapter 4. Proverbs chapter 22 talks about this, train up a child in the way he should go. And again, this is actually one of our misquoted verses. This is a proverb. This is you know, general wisdom. That doesn't mean that if you train your child great that they're guaranteed to stay faithful. But, but it's good advice nonetheless. Train your child up that even when he's old, he shouldn't depart from it. You know, Paul talks about this in Ephesians chapter 4. Fathers, don't provoke your children to anger, but bring them up in the discipline and the instruction of the Lord. The Old Testament and the New point us to this idea of remind your children about how faithful God is. I've told you this in sermons. I've, I've, I've articulated it in a variety of ways. The most powerful piece of evangelism that you have access to 
is your own story. The most powerful story that you can tell to somebody else that may not be a Christian yet is the difference that Christ has made in your life. And the great news about that is that's a story that you're an expert on. You don't need my story. You don't need my anecdotes. You don't need anything. But look at what my life was like before Christ and look what it's like after. And look at the delta in between. And he was reminding them to do this. And, of course, Paul's talking to this in church in Ephesus as well. Number three, memorize God's word to guide us in times of trial. Let's reread 8 through 11 together. You know, Joshua was, was wanting to remind them of this kind of memorial that was within the Jordan. And he told them about the words of God and remembering this, keeping God's word hidden in your heart. And there's this beautiful piece of imagery here. We see the stones hidden beneath the Jordan River. Again, these are not things that you can just see with the naked eye. But once you, once you dig, once you find them there, you recognize their significance. And again, children are asking their parents, what does this mean? And you tell them, look what God did. Is God's word not the exact same way? Right? We look at it, it seems innocuous on the outside, but you start digging. You start looking underneath the waves and you begin to see something that changes your life. Joshua wanted to remind them of this. Let's reread uh, Joshua 4, 8 through 11. The people of Israel did just as Joshua commanded and took up the 12 stones of the midst of the Jordan according to the number of the tribes of the people of Israel, just as the Lord told Joshua, and they carried them over to the place where they had lodged and laid them down. And Joshua set up 12 stones in the midst of the Jordan in the place where the feet of the priests bearing the ark had stood. And they are there to this day for the priests bearing the ark stood in the midst of the Jordan until everything was finished that the Lord commanded Joshua to tell the people. And the people passed over it. And when all the people had finished passing, the ark of the Lord and the priests passed before the people. You know, we look and, and we look even in the New Testament, we see examples for whatever was written in earlier times was written for our instruction so that through perseverance and the encouragement of Scripture, we have hope. God has always placed an emphasis on the past. Now, the beautiful thing about the church and the New Testament church is unlike Jewish tradition, which was so steeped in the old, the New Testament church, the New Covenant, is pointing to the idea of, hey, be informed by what has happened in the past, but the beauty of it is you're not bound to that past. You aren't anchored to that past any longer. You have the opportunity to come in as somebody that has no connection to that and go into the waters of baptism and receive that full inheritance. That's a beautiful thing that wasn't offered in the Old Testament, right? You were either Jewish or you weren't. And in fact, if you weren't Jewish, not only did you not have access to it, you were actively opposed, right? You were Gentile. You were anything beyond. And so the beautiful part of this is this idea of keeping God's word hidden. Joshua 4, starting in verse 12, talks about keep your oaths to God. For the sake of time, we won't read down through this. 12 and 13 reminds us of all the different tribes. It talks about the tribe of Reuben and the tribes of Manasseh and all of these things that had been pledged to God. Numbers 32 talks about this. After receiving the blessings, they had prepared uh, an exceedingly large number. Numbers 32 is what um, this tribe had set aside for God. Right? And, you know, we look at what what commitments we make, the oaths we make when we're perhaps a new Christian. And the encouragement here, of course, is fulfill the things that you promise to God. And, you know, Jesus even points us to the same thing of Matthew 5. It says, don't make false vows, but fulfill the vows you, were, uh, you made to the Lord. He reminds us of let your yes be yes, let your no be no, and anything else beyond is evil. Matthew 5 talks about this. James 5 talks about this. When you and I commit to being a Christian, that means something. When you and I cross over the Jordan, when you and I step on these stones, when you and I go through that process, now again, that's not to say that we won't make mistakes. That's not to say that we're perfect. That's not to say a lot of things. But when you put on Christ, does that mean that you have died to the old you and that you are now a new creature willing to live for Christ? Joshua is encouraging the people that had made vows to God, stand by those, to honor God for every good and perfect thing. 
Verse 14 points us to that. On that day, the Lord exalted Joshua in the sight of all of Israel, and they stood in awe of him just as they had stood in awe of Moses all the days of his life. Joshua is going to spend a lot of time honoring God for what he did. Again, not because Joshua is great, not because Moses is great, not to receive any pats on the back, but because God is worthy of the praise. James chapter 4 says, Humble yourself in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. And this is certainly the case for Joshua. Luke chapter 1, he has brought down rulers from the thrones and exalted those who were humble. The Old Testament book of Deuteronomy 28, Blessed will be those in the city, and blessed are you in the country. Every good and perfect gift comes from God. James chapter 1 talks about this at length. I want to transition briefly into New Testament, and then we'll kind of wrap up for the night. Honor Christ by telling others the route that you followed. So if you look in Joshua chapter 4, starting in verse 15, 15 down through verse 18, let's read this really quickly. The Lord said to Joshua, command the priest bearing the ark of the testimony to come up out of the Jordan. So Joshua commanded the priest, come up out of the Jordan. And when the priest bearing the ark of the covenant of the Lord came up from the midst of the Jordan, the soles of the priest of the feet were lifted up on dry ground and the waters of the Jordan returned to their place and overflowed all the banks as before. The people came up out of the Jordan on the 10th day of the first month and they encamped at Gilgal on the east border of the Jericho. Verse 20, we'll read verse 22. And then the 12 stones which took out of the Jordan, Joshua set up at Gilgal, and he said to the people of Israel, when your children, when your children ask their fathers in times to come, what do these stones mean? Circling back around to what he said before, you shall let your children know Israel passed over the Jordan on dry ground. For the Lord your God dried up the waters of the Jordan until you passed over, as the Lord your God did in the Red Sea, which he dried up until we passed over, so that all the people of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty, that you may fear the Lord your God forever. He provides us the application there at the very end. Again, we look at this and we say, Keaton, why does this matter? You and I have an opportunity to do the exact thing that these stones were meant to do for the children of Israel. God tells them, why does it matter? Why, when your children ask you, that's all well and good. But verse 24 is the kicker to this. You walked over on dry ground. You're supposed to tell your children about that. So what? So that all the people of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty and that you may fear the Lord your God forever. That's my challenge for you. You know, again, we're going to transition and keep going into Joshua chapter 5 is this beautiful scene of, of a new generation coming in. These are the people that we're, we're now going to be new to the promised land, and we see them circumcised into uh, service of the Lord. Of course, chapter 6 is the fall of Jericho. And it's chapter after chapter after faithfulness to God, but we circle back around to the practical meat of what does that mean for you and me? Again, I want to go back to, do you have stones in your own life to remind you of God's faithfulness? But maybe more importantly, are you pointing other people to those stones? Are, are, are you showing them what that does for you, not so that you get any praise, not so you and I get patted on the back, but I want to reread verse 24. I have it highlighted in all my Bibles. So that all the people of the earth may know that the hand of the Lord is mighty and that you may fear the Lord your God forever. Friends, that's what it's about. Do you have those stones? Are you reminded of your connection to God, your walk with Christ? But again, I'll challenge you once more. More importantly, are you pointing others to that? When people come and ask you, what, what do these stones mean? Why is church such a big deal? Why are you there so often? Why do you go and help clean up storm victims? Why do you go to lad sleeves? Why do you do this? Why is it such a priority? Why does it receive your time and your money and your relationships and all these other things? Why is it so important? Friends, do you have that stone to point them to? Can you point them to something in your life and say, look, look at the delta between old me and new. Look at the changes that have been made that are beyond my ability to make that change. Do you see God in this mix? That's what was the encouragement to Israel, and that's my challenge for you tonight. Tonight, if you aren't a Christian, we want to give you that opportunity to become one 
that you might step into the waters. Again, the, the, the beautiful landmark of, of the story of Joshua is the Jordan River. And we know that many at that time, uh, the Jordan River remained a hallmark. It became a landmark all throughout, even into the New Testament. But water has remained a constant theme even into the New Testament, of course, becoming the, the, the vehicle for which baptism can happen. Maybe that's your need tonight to come and to put on Christ in baptism. We would love to help you with that. Maybe you're struggling and just need prayers. We'd love to help you with that too. If we can do anything for you, would you come forward as we stand and as we sing together?